Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn, and I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, um, where I run a variety of information services, run events and activities and so on for the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, and medical publishing. And at the moment, I'm running a, a series of Zoom meetings, um, which I intended to reach out and, and allow people all over the world to join in. Uh, we can involve interesting people from wherever they are um, and talk to an interesting audience wherever they are. And we can, hopefully, all being well, capture the uh, recording and post it on Network Pharma TV, where you'll find now hundreds of videos, actually, but certainly and quite a number of these sorts of Zoom webinars, but hundreds of videos now all to do with Medcom. So hopefully there's a useful resource building up there. So thank you very much for joining in. Today, we're gonna to be talking about social media, which is a little bit of a pet uh, soapbox for me. Um, so I'm looking forward to this one. Um, and we basically, I've asked the authors of a recent article in the MAP newsletter from ISMAP, the International Society for Medical Publications Professionals, if I've got that right. Um, so three of the authors of that article on social media, a useful tool or distraction in medical publications, have agreed to come along. Um, I'm gonna ask Linda if she can uh, pick it up and introduce herself and talk us through a presentation, and then we're gonna go on some Q&A. So over to you, Linda, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just checking that you can all see my slides. Um, I'm can. just, fantastic. I just want to say thank you, Peter, for inviting us to participate in your webinar series, and I, I hope everybody enjoys it. I think it is a very interesting subject. So a quick overview of who we are. My name's Linda Chang. I'm a scientific director at Complete Health Vision, a McCann Health Company. I'm Beatrice Fadal-Cheriotti, and I'm also a medical writer for C3, um, based in Glasgow, in Scotland. And I'm Tamil Letlow, an associate scientific director at Complete Health Vision. I'm coming to you from the early morning hours in the US. Thank you very much, Tamilet. I hope you've had lots of coffee. Okay, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of what we are hoping to talk about today. So why should medical publication professionals engage in social media? What are the current challenges for medical publication professionals? What can um, we learn from social media dialogue on publications? And finally, I'll finish up where we'll talk a little bit about what social media should look like. So before I start, uh, we'd also like to thank Grace Miller, who is our co-author and is not able to join, um, and Rhiannon Meaden and Robert Poole, also of Complete Health Vision, uh, for the conceptual contribution to the article. As Peter said, this presentation is based on the social media, a useful tool or distraction in medical publications article. Um, and we want to thank Anna Garacci, who um, helped us bring this to life. Um, and if you want a bit more information, there is a link right at the end of this presentation for you to take a look. So a very quick disclaimer, uh, we've all seen these before, so I'll just move on very quickly and get into the meat of it. So why should we engage in social media and where is the added value? Well, the fantastic thing about social media is it's fast and it's immediate. I mean, we know that outside of science, you can get information on current affairs sometimes even faster than uh, the news agencies can do it. Benefits are that it has a huge audience potential, including traditionally difficult to reach groups, such as GPs and nurses and even patient groups. And it allows for scientific debate and exchange, and you can, ex you can engage on many different levels from a simple link sharing through to creating global collaborations. And, and there is evidence to suggest that those global collaborations are just going to continue to grow. I think of most use uh, to us as publication professionals, it, um, it gives us metrics. It helps us understand what people are saying, what people are feeling about your data or any data that we're putting out there, and also any uh, sort of reveals any misconceptions or gaps in knowledge that where we need to address. But, and this is the big but, to pharma are currently wary to go beyond simple levels of engagement, so link sharing, um, to, to debate, you know, they don't want to have too much commentary and debate because they don't want to be seen as being promotional or biased. And uh, Beatrice will discuss that in a bit more detail. Thank you, Linda. So with these great benefits and opportunities that 
um, social media can offer there are also naturally challenges for us as publication professionals scientists. Um, and therefore we must carefully consider the limitations and also the potential risks um, that occur when we share um, such information on social media and um, we should make sure that these informations are accurate and balanced and based on robust scientific data um, but how to strike a fair balance between such in-depth debate and discussion versus the quick and easy consumption of information that we can have and is provided by social media is, is a great challenge. Next slide, please. Um, and the FDA has actually provided a draft guidance for industry um, on its activity on social media and advising that any social media um, that is presenting a drug must be balanced and include both the benefits and the serious risks of these products. Um, but the challenge remains and also gaps are in, in that guidance. What about the engagement of publications and drugs that aren't approved yet? Next slide, please. And with that come um, the pitfalls. Um, so the, the risk lies um, in the risk of oversimplification. And I think everybody remembers that the headlines when, when it said bacon causes cancer. And that might be true, but the, with the loss of nuance and the, the depth of scientific debate behind it, um, there lies the potential for, for legal challenges and misinterpretation um, when it's oversimplified. And that also ties in if we have off-label discussions or an inaccurate interpretation on social media, um, which ties back to that. And then we could also think about how much should pharma really be saying with this and or should it be left in the realm of the authors or the audience to discuss further? Next slide, please. And that's where we come in. Where can we help as Medcom's agencies? Um, we can certainly highlight the discussion to the stakeholders, but any action should really be coming from the pharma companies and within them that would require their medical, legal and regulatory approvals. Um, and also we need to make sure that the material created for social media should be faithful and unbiased. And with that, I hand over to Tamalette. Thank you, Beatrice. So interactions with your audience or just monitoring the social activity surrounding your communications or publications provides multiple benefits. The most important is that the information is collected in real time so you can keep up with the ever-changing hot topics. Some evaluations that you can perform include knowing if the right audience is being reached, and how engaged they are. You can observe what they think about the data or information that you are providing. If someone is especially engaged with the data and are doing research in the area, a potential collaboration may be of mutual benefit to advance the field. Other insights may provide further research ideas that you may not have considered or provide a counterpoint that needs evaluation. All of this information can be used to refine your product's communication, education, and clinical development throughout the year, and not just at specified review times. This ensures that your activities continually meet the needs of your audience. However, to use or monitor social media effectively, there are several considerations or learnings that need to be taken into account. Understanding the timing of social media use is imperative. Anything new can become a hot topic, or anything new associated with an older topic could be of interest. And this could last for as little as a few days, to a few weeks, or for up to a few months. For the older topics, you can see spikes in attention when the new information is generated and presented. However you assess it, early engagement is definitely what you want especially for Twitter use. For scientific publications, journal participation in social media makes a big difference in audience engagement. Research into this area for Twitter has indicated that journal tweets have more retweets than individuals. And journal Twitter activity correlates with their research or number of followers. In addition to Twitter, journals may participate in multiple platforms such as other networking sites like Facebook and YouTube, bookmarking sites, reference sharing sites, news links, or even blogging. These all allow for greater interactions with a diverse audience and increase the reach of your traditional publication. Therefore, 
it is good to know journal policies on participation in social media as part of your assessment for a manuscript submission. Now that we have considered all of this, Linda will speak to what our social media content could look like. Thank you, Tamalet. So what should it look like? Well, I think the most important thing that we have to remember is that HCPs don't have a lot of time. I think this comes up over and over again if you speak to any doctor or any thought leader that we work with, you know, that their time is very constrained with patients um, and with paperwork. And, you know, they quite often do say to us, you know, I'd love to spend a bit more time reading a paper, uh, reading an article and, and knowing about my subject area. So when we're thinking about um, developing materials for which could go along with a publication we try to follow the east behavioral principle so the east behavioral principle means that it's easy it's attractive it's social and it's timely to go into a bit more detail about this uh, particularly in publications um, any material that we create should be easy to read in which case it needs to be accurate but succinct. We like to use the term snackable content. It needs to be attractive because it needs to be visually appealing to catch the eye of um, our audience. Um, you know, and we can be accurate, but we should always include a link um, to the main article because if you catch their attention, they will click on the link and they will look at that paper and you know, perhaps interact with it more. It needs to be social. So when we talk about being social, we talk about it being interactive. You know, we are talking about social media so that we need to make it easy for people to interact with it. We need to make it easy for people to click on it, to link to it, to share it, to discuss it. Um, and finally, we're talking about it needing to be timely. And, I, and I'm gonna come back a little bit to what Tamalette was saying in that you really want to be thinking about planning to release any social media content with the release of the um, manuscript itself. Um, so we need to work with journals and authors to actually have a plan of action, um, you know, to make sure that everything comes out together and everybody can see it all together in, in one go. And obviously those require those discussions with uh, journals in terms of um, copyright issues you know these are things that we need to discuss and I think as uh, medical publications professionals we can facilitate that but it all needs to be planned out in advance and in, on us, in all honesty I think in the future a multi-channel approach will be the norm so you know if we start thinking about it now it becomes less painful and much easier and you know everybody can get involved and I think it just makes doctors lives easier and hopefully also patients lives easier as well you know we're, we're all about improving outcomes for patients but if if we can get the right drug to the right patient or the right information to the right patient um and also to the doctors then you know we can definitely help improve lives so if you wanted to know a little bit more about this um our article is in the map um, along the top, you can see the link to it. I'm hoping that Peter will also be able to put, put a link on uh, Network Pharma TV um, after the end of this webinar. I just wanted to say thank you. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'll hand back to you, Peter. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, we've lost the slides. OK, so this is where the audience should join in if we're lucky. Uh, so can I just, again, just say to the audience, um, there are two ways of joining in here. Uh, at the bottom of your screens, you have a Q&A button and the chat button. It pulls up a couple of text screens. Uh, please just type any observations, comments, or questions in there. And we're gonna be led a little bit by you guys. So uh, feel free to ask your questions. Um, I'd like to just try and get a little bit specific, if I may. Um, and push me back if I'm if I'm asking anything that you don't want to um, to comment on, Linda or, or anybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued. Uh, you know, so I, I've been I've been thinking I've been active in this marketplace for a number of years. Online is great. Social media, all about spontaneity. Um, you know, it's reacting to things, whatever. And yet, 
there's always been this sort of sense with pharma a they don't want to get involved b if they're going to get involved it's so planned it's so planned it's so planned that nothing happens or whatever happens is too late sort of thing well just give me a little bit more favor if you can maybe if we can talk generically about some cases or something what actually is going on because we can talk general general generalities but is it really happening what are people really doing are you really sitting there and coming up with a plan and, and so on. And, and what what exactly are you doing? Can you just t give me a little bit more, a little bit more detail, if you can? Is that a fair question? Yeah. No. I think that's that's fair enough. I mean, we do have one case study, and and I think I think the most important thing is probably to get your authors involved. Um, we developed a really interactive poster, um, and one of our authors he put it on LinkedIn, and he got over six hundred hits off of LinkedIn and you know lots of interest so I think in terms of bias and you know and, and, and farmers reluctance to get involved which is you know which is fair enough um, I think there is an opportunity and perhaps an onus that we work with the uh, authors you know to to get them involved as well and, and I don't know if you saw but Tamalette and I were involved in a poster where we actually did look um, and we saw that actually sometimes author engagement actually increases engagement with an article as well. You know, if they tweet it out, then somebody else will come along and have a look. In terms of pharma, we all know that they, you know, despite being at the forefront of research, um, regulatory and compliance issues do still exist. And, and I think you need to be discussing with your client uh sooner rather than later and talking about the benefits you know and and i think it is it's a difficult one because you know what if somebody comes along and says oh i want to use this drug for this off label what does pharma do i mean they they can put out the generic tweet that sort of says you know we do not recommend this it is not in the label um but beyond that you know what more can they do so yes there is spontaneity but I think, I mean, if you look at Twitter campaigns that are going on, if, you, if you're looking at the current political landscape, I'm pretty certain every tweet that goes out is a planned tweet, if you're even just thinking about politics. I don't know if that helps to answer your question, Peter. Uh, I'm not sure. I certainly don't think lots of tweets are being planned at the moment on the politics side, but there you go. All right. Um, at least they, if they are, that's bizarre. Um, but as I, as I, I, I'm still struggling with this, you know, um, what actually happens. I'm trying to imagine this conversation that's going on um, when you're planning a publication. You've got authors, you've got public, uh, you've got the journal, yourselves, the pharma company, funder, whatever. You know, who's, who's sort of leading the discussion on social media engagement and and, and 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 if the author goes yeah i can just go out and you know do whatever i like with this is there any kickback against that if you know there must be at the farmer end a little bit concerned what about the journal end you no know, journals there's a mixed bag out there are there any of the journals actually saying yay go or are they saying um you cannot say anything we've got to say it or well, well, i just i just think there must be a more complicated picture here which i'd just like to tease out a little bit I mean, I would, I would say that journals are open to uh, increasing traffic to their sites. And, but I agree that, you know, I think it's, it's a constant discussion that you need to be having with um, all the stakeholders and all the parties involved. You know, who's most comfortable doing what? Um, I think some journals are better at it than others. You know, your typical New England journals, they're quite happy to go out and tweet their own things. But I don't think I've ever seen them turn around and say, no, the author can't tweet about it. You know, as long as it sort of gets linked to the actual journal article itself, you know, then that drives traffic back to the journal. And, and I, I don't see why the journal would be upset about that. Farmer um, uh, is a difficult one. <clears throat> Uh, and I'm not sure that, you know, I think we're going to be doing some more research uh, trying to understand the role of pharma um, in sort of social media interactions, particularly with publications. So I guess all I can say at this point is watch this space. OK, OK. Let's just bounce around here a little bit. We've got Claire, 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 Claire from ADIS, I think, saying from a journal perspective, we actively try to encourage pharma and authors to tweet as well as our own tweet, but pharma often say they prefer to leave this to the authors, the journal. 
So that's, again, following your sort of um, idea. You're pushing it back to the author. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in about, um, and this is, this is one that uh, there's no answer to this, but let's just see what you, what you guys answer. So you're talking about social media, but actually you're mostly talking about Twitter. So you're not, are you, are you primarily talking about Twitter? What other sort of, you know, platforms, um, forms of social media would you include in your, in your overall description there? Um, yes, I think most of the research has been done on Twitter and I think Tamalette knows quite a lot about that. Um, but I think, you know, the case study that I suggested with global collaborations that actually came through ResearchGate. Um, I think there are LinkedIn discussions that are going on and, you know, it's a very professional uh, social media site. I think Facebook uh, and Ilk are probably falling a little bit to the wayside. Um, so I don't think it's probably the most appropriate anymore. Um, but you know, I, I see, I see Reddit, um, and you know, there's a lot of authors who actually go on there and sort of say, you know, I've done this article, ask me anything about it. And you know, the, there's huge responses on that. Um, and you know, and that potentially could be another option. Uh, I don't think pharma, I've never seen a pharma, uh, tweet about or sort of put a question up on Reddit on there, but you know, it is another option. So yes, most of the research has been done on Twitter, but you know, there are other options and you know, even the likes of Instagram um, could be useful, especially if you're gonna be posting something, you know, that's visually interesting. Um, in Instagram could be a place to put it. Okay, I did. I, I, we shouldn't get too far into that because I mean, like LinkedIn, I wouldn't regard as social media, and we can we can argue over the terms and terminology. Um, so, um, so, but we are talking about beyond Twitter and and various online means to reach an audience. And part of the part of the problem you've talked about how you can use, um, I think, uh, if I'm quoting you correctly, so basically you can you can you can look at providing information to particular target audiences. That's difficult on the sort of social media type platforms we're talking about at the moment so one uh, one question is you know what are the problems of basically just talking very openly about some of this stuff um, and hoping the right people come along um, secondly have you got any experience of any very specific let's call them social media channels um, as in healthcare professional communities or, or, or whatever and, and again do you use a mix of those have you used a mix of those okay um, for the first question I might pass that to uh, Beatrice um, and then perhaps the second question um, around reaching different groups, I might pass to Tamalette because uh, some of the research we did for our hashtag poster could fit in here. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Again, I was reading on the on the side in the panel. Oh, you can't do that to me. <laughs> and the first, the first question I think I was asking was was about the you know you you've talked about you know you can target information at or at target groups, but actually we're talking about very open platforms where you're actually talking very widely to a wide audience. That was my first question. My second question was about targeting using so-called social media platforms for want of a better expression like healthcare professionals specialist communities and so on but the first one it just you know it, targeting to a particular group when you're using something like twitter is actually extremely difficult um, and i just wonder what what comments you've got on that i think if you, if, you, if you target the wider group i think um it's hard to the pitfalls come back in if you oversimplify simplify too much um to make sure you read this reach as many people as possible, then you, you lose the nuance, you lose the scientific accuracy and the risk lies within that. And if you're too specialized, then you might cut out some of your target audience that don't get get through the filters, let's say, and they don't they don't recognize it going through their feet, they don't they wouldn't probably pick it up if it's if it's too Okay, so again, what I'm what I'm getting at is, you know, the author, and if we leave it to the author, they're probably just going, look, I don't care who sees this or reads this or clicks to my paper or whatever. Then, you know, it's all good, and there's an element of the the, the interesting people will will sort of filter out of that. Again, I'm coming back to sort of the regulatory type of environment we're all working in, and and whether anyone, you know, what sort of concerns come up in these meetings about talking very openly um, about this stuff. Um, and I would have thought tweets on Twitter, even using hashtags or whatever is going to raise concerns rather than minimize concerns. I'm, I just, I mean, maybe you, you, you can't or, or, or you haven't got that sort of um, insight, but I just, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm just interested to try and get a sense of what, what those issues are. 
Have, have you used any of these specialist communities? Would you include the specialist communities in the sort of plan that you've you've outlined? I think you could potentially. Um, I mean, I'm, at the moment, I'm thinking about uh, the simpler project. I don't know if you know of that, Peter, um, but that is a hashtag project. Um, where they are collating all the sort of known hashtags for different therapy areas um, and you know using those hashtags you can um, almost direct an audience to a particular disease so you know if a patient or a doctor is looking for a particular disease they just type in the disease and the hashtag will pull that out um, which I think helps a little bit you know if you're trying to target your audience um, but you know, it, it is that it is that classic. If you don't have the right hashtag, you're not going to hit the right patients. You're not going to hit the right audiences, the right doctors. Um, and I think it's an ongoing thing that uh, that sort of is still a long way off. I think, but it's a start. But no, I agree. Uh, it is difficult to target a particular audience. Um, but if you don't try, then it's never going to get any easier. Okay, okay. So Megan's coming in from one of the farm companies, from the farmer's side. Our hands are tied in lots of ways. Okay, we're all sort of talking about this. Trying to create social media content, addresses FDA guidance and clears legal department is extremely difficult. Um, we need more clear guidance. Basically, uh, she, the question is, can the likes of ISMAP, um, I guess, I don't know whether you can speak on behalf of ISMAP, but what's your view on, or other organizations like um, uh, Pharma, uh, help create more clear guidances. Um, do, do, do you see them giving us more guidance? And, and to come back, I mean, we, it does feel like we've spent years waiting for guidance from these organizations. Um, you've mentioned FDA, you didn't mention FDA, ADPI, and so on. Um, I'm getting a little bit out of date with this sort of thing, but you know, how much recent guidance has there been for many of these sorts of organizations, either on the industry side, or the regulatory side? Uh, Beatrice, how old are those FDA guidelines? I think they're from 2014, so in, in terms yeah, of okay. social media, it's quite outdated half a decade ago, um, and it's still under, under draft guidance, so it's not even updated yet to be full guidance. Um, I think if, if we had something similar along the lines of GPP3 and just having some consensus from, from ISMAP and, and maybe the FDA or, or Pharma or some consortium to provide guidelines, I think that would potentially help and pave the way to, to enable us to use social media more to, to engage the audiences, the HCPs and the patients. Um, and that will certainly help uh, to bring this yeah. forward. But no, in, no insider knowledge there of anything that's about to come out and hit the streets from these organizations that will help us? Um, not at present. I know ISMAP are doing a lot of research in the area, but beyond that, I, I don't, I, we've not really heard much, but no, I think it's long overdue. Okay, well, again, I'll just make the point. We've got an interesting audience, a mixed audience out there. If anybody is sitting there going, oh, for goodness sake, don't you know about whatever, then please do share, all right, because we're all, we're all here to learn from each other here, yeah? Um, just out of interest, to go off in a slightly different direction, um, I, was, I, I was never caught up in it, but I was very aware. Uh, going back a little bit, um, a number of people were getting quite excited about journal Twitter clubs, you know, to, to keep it, you know, really to foam in on the talking about the research type side of it. Um, I, I don't know what's happened. I mean, there, there were a number of, of really quite well-known and quite enthusiastic groups doing Twitter journal clubs. I just wonder whether you've seen any of that recently. Is there anything we can point people at? Um, has it, was it a bit of a fad? I must admit, I've not seen a lot of, um, a lot of activity recently, but it seems like a good idea. Why, why might it not have kept going if it hasn't kept going? My PhD in my old research group at Strathclyde, um, there they had a Twitter club um, going for microbiology, and that was I think every two weeks. Um, but that was also a couple of years ago. Um, but it was really cool to kind of engage with the audience and connect with people all over the world and talk about recent papers. Um, I haven't seen it since I've joined Medcoms. So. Um, I'm the journal of I don't know if it's American Radiology, but they certainly um have advocated having a journal twitter club uh, i think hawkins has produced two articles i haven't seen anything too recently i, I think his last one was maybe 2016 um but this is this is sort of you know um i think they got a lot more engagement when they were talking to uh, when they actually got the journal editors involved um honestly i think it's a time thing I lost you there slightly at the end. Sorry, there's a time thing, yeah? It's just yeah, everyone's so busy, yeah? 
Yes. Which is a shame, yeah, really. We really need a champion to take this on and devote time to it. And it's generally they start out like with any journal club, everybody's all excited, but without a champion to do it week after week and organize it and have topics, it, it does tend to die out. I mean, I can, I can sort of say with a certain depth of feeling that anything like this, like, like what I'm doing, you know, it's hard to keep it going. <laughs> you have to sort of be pretty bloody minded, really. Um, but um, but who, who sh I mean, from your perspective, um, what do you think? Should the journals be taking more initiative in running journal clubs for their own journals? Or, you know, again, is it authors as part of, you know, specialist areas of respiratory medicine, or whatever, you know, driving it? Or, I don't know. I mean, it'd be difficult to see, or is it difficult to see Pharma running a journal club on Twitter? Um, is it difficult to see a Medcoms agency running a, a journal club on Twitter? Who do you think should be taking the initiative? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I don't think it should be Medcoms because we don't own the data. We, you know, we, we can advise, but I do think journals probably could take a, a greater role in that. You know, it, it's, it's their audiences. Um, and I think, I think it, it's a good way of building up a reputation and a rapport with your, right, you know, with your uh, authors and your readers. Um, I think pharma could potentially get involved, whether or not they would actually get involved in a journal club themselves. I know they have internal journal clubs, um, but whether or not they would be willing to do that online, you know, if I'm thinking about compliance, um, that that could be tricky um, because, you know, they, they don't want to be, they don't want to get caught up in thinking, you know, we're, we're trying to shape the way a disease uh, is thought about. I, I suspect that that could be an issue for them, um, which is a shame, really, because you know, in the end, we're all about sharing science together. But you know, you can understand certainly uh, farmer's point of view in that respect. So I think, in the first instance, probably journals. Again, I'm going to express my or show my ignorance here, which is vast, obviously, as everyone knows. So um, why am I being embarrassed about it? Um, there was a lot of fuss, but I'm losing track of time, about conference organisers who were clamping down on Twitter, uh, tweeting from conferences. And just again, have you got any insight into maybe what's going on at the moment? Have uh, are, are conference organisers or are some conference organisers still being very prescriptive about what can can't be happening you know are conferences reasonably or relaxed these days there seems to be a lot i mean i can go into most conferences and see twitter activity but i know i know at one stage there was a real clamp down from a couple of the organizers and i just wonder whether you've got any insight um on what's happened there or again if the audience has got any comments what's the latest thinking on that front um i i gonna open this one out but i haven't seen any pushback recently i don't know if it's just that you know they they feel that it's a uh, you know it, Twitter is almost a done deal um, and they might as well join the crowd. Um, but I mean, if you look at the big the big congresses, you, you, the likes of ASCO, you know they're they're massive on tweeting. And if you just put in hashtag ASCO for whichever year you're in, the number of tweets that are coming out of it are vast. And it, and it's not just ASCO tweeting. It's it's also um, attendees who are sort of saying oh this was a really interesting tidbit uh, that i picked up and you know and, the, and then that's getting forwarded on forwarded on and and honestly I, I think conference tweeting is is probably um more it's probably a bigger thing than perhaps journal tweeting that's what i that's what i can see um at the moment in the current trends i don't know tamala if you have any other thoughts in the us perhaps uh, no, I agree. Um, and ASCO, it is big, and all the larger conferences have a lot of these uh, activities. And you do see more Twitter activity around surrounding these conferences. Then, at least for the research that we did on the journals, uh, greater than what we've seen from journal articles themselves. Um, sorry, Beatrice, were you going to say something there? Sorry, I wasn't sure. No. No, okay. <laughs> and, and I suppose a, a key question, which I'm not sure you, you, you sort of touched on slightly, but in terms of research that proves that any of this actually works in practice, um, my understanding is there isn't very much. And, and for instance, in your article, you quote a number of references for posters at ISMAP and so on, most of which aren't published. 
Um, just, you know, have you got any observations on that side or any, anywhere, any, any, any thoughts on that front? Because it's a constant, or it seems to me, a, a constant source of disappointment, really, that there isn't any more published data out there to really back up what would seem to be obvious that, you know, talking about stuff is useful. Am I being fair or unfair? I, th I think there's a lot of talking about it. Um, I've seen a lot of um, websites talk about it, uh, you know, they, but at the moment they're mostly talking it in terms of promotional things. You know, if I'm looking at business websites that talk about the impact of social media, it, it certainly seems to be sort of more marketing and advertising and promotion that I've seen. In terms of publications, I think you're right. I don't think there is much out there or, you know, what is out there is is very, you know, very sparse or small uh, populations, um, small sample groups that we're looking at. And part of it is because at the moment, I think we're still trying to figure out what the questions are. Okay, okay. I do like the way these things sort of like dovetail. So I'll take the opportunity to say that we are going to um uh be having the publishers on uh, a zoom webinar in a few weeks time uh, we've got a panel of publishers i think we've got four at the moment so i think i can see some of these obvious questions being being coming up there see what they're doing from their side in the journal uh, the journals themselves doing yeah that'll be interesting okay all right look i've got what i've got an eye on the phone we are we're at the time we are um, we are sort of coming to the end of the time that i'd hoped to sort of keep for the recording so can i just say thanks guys i i, I there's a there's a part of me that just thinks we've been talking about this for years and we're not getting very far forward but maybe that maybe that's overly cynical and maybe we should just look at the fact that we are at least all still trying um, and there must be some some progress being made so um uh thank you very much for coming online to the audience that's listening to us uh, live as it were don't all run away unless you have to because we'll carry on talking for a little bit uh, to the top of the hour um but in the meantime can i just um close the uh, the recording part of this so if everyone can just say bye bye with a little wave that'll be the end of that okay say bye bye <laughs>